Good evening, or good morning for some, and welcome to the second in our series of seven GCLR web seminars for 2013-2014, featuring Dr. Jack Richards. We would like to welcome back our participants to the GCL web webinar who have joined us in the past over our three-year history. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. We are glad you are here tonight. Your moderators for this evening are Dr. Peggy Albers and Dr. Dennis Odo, professors of language and literacy at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, and me, David Brown, language and literacy doctoral student at Georgia State University. We are joined by our GCLR research team, Christy Pace, Suba Ange Crowder, Aram Cho, Ji Hei Shin, Sarah Turnbull, and Jin Jung, all doctoral students at Georgia State University. Global Conversations in Literacy Research consists of online interactive web seminars with the intent to circulate cutting edge research in the fields of literacy and language arts. GCLR is a research project seeks volunteers for our study of critical literacy professional development in online spaces. If you are willing to participate in a brief interview, please type your email address into the chat area and a research team member will contact you within a few days to schedule an appointment. We also invite you to take our survey. The link is on our GCLR website. The data collected will provide important information for understanding our research regarding web seminars and their impact on international literacy discussions. During tonight's web seminar, if you have any comments or questions, please type them into the chat box. Dr. Odo will monitor that area, and Dr. Richards will address these at the end of the presentation. We would love to know where you're where you're participating from in tonight's webinar. So please use the star tool located to the immediate left of this slide and click your location on the map. If you're having trouble locating the star tool, a picture of it is located at the bottom of the slide. Also, if you would, please type in the chat area your location, what city, state, or country you're from. Great. It's so nice to see so many people from so many different places across our country and our globe. Tonight's seminar features Dr. Jack Richards, who will address bringing a creative disposition to teaching as one quality among the many that characterize effective teachers. He has written over 100 books and articles on language teaching methodology and teacher training. His most recent books are Practice Teaching and Cambridge Guide to Pedagogy and Practice. Dr. Richards has held senior positions in universities in New Zealand, Hawaii, and Hong Kong, and is currently an honorary professor at Sydney University, an adjunct professor at the Regional Language Center Singapore, and in 2013-14, visiting distinguished professor at City University, Hong Kong. He is also an active art collector and a sponsor of numerous activities in music and the arts. To learn more about Dr. Richard's work, please access his website and his Amazon page. At this time, it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jack Richard and his presentation entitled Creativity in Language Teaching. Let's give him a virtual round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, and hello, everybody. I can hear some little bells ringing, but um, I think we're online now. Um, thanks for joining me tonight, and I look forward to uh, discussing with you some of the issues that I cover. Now, um, as you probably realize, my background is in language teaching, but uh, some of the uh, principles that I'll be discussing I think are fairly generic and would apply, apply to the teaching of any subject area. Of course, um, 
creativity is an issue that is uh, is becoming more and more in focus, not only in education but in in all domains really. And um, it's said to be the driving force of success in a number of different endeavors. And for that reason, it's there's been a transfer to thinking about what it means to be a creative teacher. Uh, my field, as I said, is language teaching, and I'm particularly interested in the training of English language teachers and what what are the qualities and dispositions and, and skills that effective teachers access and use during their teaching. So that's the background to what I'm going to share with you today. It was prompted initially by um, some research I reviewed uh, that took place in the UK where a number of schools where creative teaching had been identified were studied by a team of researchers followed up by uh, observations and interviews. And I looked at some of the principles that um, emerged from those studies and tried to follow through with conversations with English language teachers in different countries to see whether some of the same principles could be evident in their work. And this, the data set, um, initially was um, a set of uh, written and, sp and um, email communications with teachers in a number of countries who had attended my presentations and uh, I asked some of those uh, teachers to engage in a, in a conversation with me and they, um, they submitted um, written essays in which they described the philosophies that they uh, drew on in their teaching. And um, those that looked to reflect a more creative disposition, I thought it through. Uh, we had uh, meetings with a number of them and uh, other forms of communication and from those conversations I've um, abstracted a number of principles that I want to share with you tonight. Now, just to start with uh, a little definition of what creativity is that you see there on the screen, activity fashioned so as to produce outcomes that are both original and of value, and often identified with these kind of um, processes, if you like, solving problems in original ways, original thoughts, and so on. Um, and so those, again, are the, the data sources that I'm drawing on uh, in this presentation. I'm going to um, look at three different aspects of creative teaching. Firstly, the qualities creative teachers possess, in other words, the sort of cognitive side of things, how these are applied in their teaching, and how creativity can be supported in the school. When we talk about creativity, we can look at it from two points of view. One is in terms of products. What are the results of creative thinking? We see these, of course, in, in, in art, in literature, in various other domains. We see the products that are the results of creativity. The other issue has to do with the processes that creative thinkers um, uh, draw upon in creating these products. And I'm going to be sort of going back and forth, if you like, between product and process. Um, so the first uh, the first of the principles that uh, I want to look at has to do with the knowledge base that teachers draw upon because um, creativity doesn't mean creativity for its own sake. I think one can uh, distinguish between purposeful and purposeless creativity. And what I mean by purposeful creativity is creativity that's, um, that draws upon knowledge, pedagogical knowledge, um, theoretical knowledge, other forms of knowledge. And here we see um, an example of a teacher describing uh, her reference to a, a knowledge base here as the teacher talks about how he or she, how the teacher approaches a lesson. And in doing so, the teacher describes the technique that she used in this case to do with uh, a narrative text. But you can see that she refers to her, her knowledge of the nature of narrative text here. So it's, in other words, she's not using this activity just because it's fun and, 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 uh, and creative, but because it reinforces um, uh, her understanding, the learner's understanding of the nature of narrative text. So this is the principle of uh, drawing on uh, a knowledge base here. Second principle uh, has to do with the confidence because, of course, to be creative, you have to be fairly sure of your um, you're sure of yourself and uh, have confidence to be able to to do things differently. So confidence, in a sense, gives teachers a sense that they are in control of their classroom. 
and that it's the teacher, not the, not the book or the curriculum that can make a difference here. And we see this in the first quote there from Jose in Ecuador, who talks about the uh, personalization of his teaching space so that when students come to the classroom, they feel that they're going to participate in an activity that's been personally created by the teacher for them. Confidence. We see this in another example here from a teacher in Peru who talks about the importance of confidence and how his, um, uh, his experience has enabled him to, to become more confident, to uh, follow his own intuitions more, to try out new approaches and strategies. So confidence. Um, the third principle, learner commitment, if you like. And one of the, um, the uh, things that came across in my conversation with the teachers was that um, they're constantly seeking to adjust their teaching in order to better facilitate learning rather than simply sticking to their book or their lesson plan. They also seek to, seek to develop their learner's confidence. I like this, um, uh, this uh, statement that uh, Rosalind here made that uh, self-assurance can inspire second language learners to pass through the door of the world of English. Um, uh, committed to helping their learners succeed. So they, in a sense, they put the learners uh, at the center of their thinking rather than the teacher. Here, uh, oh, this is a, another, this is the next principle I want to talk about, non-conformity here. The, um, the uh, educator Bruner, um, I think it was, is this defined conformity as the enemy of creativity. He said it reduces the, the likelihood of creating fresh points of view. And he talked about creativity in terms of acts that produce effective surprises. Um, and um, the, uh, the creative teacher then doesn't simply follow the book, but looks for original ways of creating lessons using the textbook and teaching materials uh, and seeking to create lessons that reflect his or her individual um, teaching style. So learning to be a creative teacher doesn't mean modeling or copying the practices of other teachers, but rather understanding the principles that underlie creative teaching. And of course, um, individual teachers will uh, reflect these principles in different ways. So non-conformist here, as David says, I try to think of every lesson I teach as a unique experience. And Alejandra looks for ways of giving a different twist to activities. Otherwise, both the teacher and the students would soon get bored. I'm going to, by the way, in this first part of the talk, discuss eight of these general principles. And then we'll look at how, in more detail, at how the teachers apply these principles in their teaching. Um, here's Susanna saying different ways of maintaining student involvement in the lesson throughout her teaching. So creative teachers are often individualists, aren't they? Um, they, in a sense, stand out from the crowd. Of course, to be creative, you have to have uh, available a wide repertoire of routines and strategies to call upon, as well as the willingness to depart from established procedures. So I suppose it's true that, in general, uh, novice teachers are much less likely to be creative than experienced teachers, simply because they don't have so many uh, tricks, if you like, uh, to draw upon, so many uh, strategies and techniques that they can make use of. Of course, the danger um, is that once a teacher becomes comfortable in using a core set of techniques and strategies, these tend to become fixed. Now, here, um, Manuel talks about the repertoire of strategies he has for dealing with a reading passage, sometimes using texts, closed versions of a passage, and so on and how he tries to add new techniques to his repertoire every year. So having available then a wide range of techniques and strategies. Of course, to be creative um, is a risky undertaking as well because you um, need to be willing to experiment to try things out. And that means um, willingness to take risks. And risk taking reflects the, the flexible mindset of creative teachers as well as their self-confidence. They're willing to try things out even if they 
may not even work as well as they are intended. Now here a teacher talks about an activity that he, um, he thought would be effective because it draws on second language acquisition theory using activities that, um, draws, uh, that take students back to a text that they have heard or read and then focusing on um, noticing some of the language that has been used in those texts. Um, and though the idea sounded good, he said it, students didn't find it interesting. So he's rethinking how he might this, uh, make this activity more engaging. So he's willing to think or advise or, if necessary, abandon the original plan and try something else. So this is seen as a learning moment and not as an indication of failure, risk taking. Um, and here is a teacher from Cambodia also talking about the willingness to try things out and, if you like, to learn from mistakes. Let's go back a second there. Basically, uh, when he started out um, pretty uh, scared of applying new ideas, and this is a teacher I worked with in Singapore, um, and now if he's uh, going to try out a new technique for the first time, it's not completely successful, he'll adapt his strategy and try again, risk taking. The notion of um, learner centeredness is a trait that appeared in a number of the comments. That is, uh, teachers who listen to their learners and who seek opportunities for learners to take responsibility and control of their learning. And an important feature of learner-centered lessons is the extent to which the lesson connects with the learner's uh, life experiences. So uh, here, uh, Sulian talks about engaging the learners in selecting content for lessons. And so if the lesson's about narratives, she lifts, shifts the focus of the lesson to something that's more personally engaging for the students. And here is um, Patrick in Thailand um, talking about how he in, in encourages his students to bring to class words or expressions or idioms that they may have encountered. And he uses these as the basis for vocabulary building and argues that the words they bring are much more interesting than the ones in the book. And that um, reminds me of a book that um, a very distinguished New Zealander that I knew when I was a young scholar, Silver Ashton Warner, which those of you who are in literacy studies should read her book, Teacher, because that book describes how when she was working with indigenous children in New Zealand, she sort of threw away the Ministry of Education textbooks and had the children bring words from their home experience, from their home life, often um, problematic uh, home experiences, but she built the reading materials around the words that the children um, brought with them to school. I recommend you to have a look at that book, Teacher by Sylvia Ashton Warner. It's an old book. It's a classic, but still um, uh, very interesting. And it also uh, it makes use of this uh, principle here and the same technique that Patrick's using here in his work with uh, learners in Thailand, having students bring words they want to focus on. Of course, the teacher would have to be selective as to those the teacher wanted to pursue and do more work with. Learner-centeredness. And here, um, Carolina, is talking about um, having students likewise bring things they want to talk about to class, magazine, clips, whatever, and she puts them in groups. I like this idea. Um, they talk about each item and, oops, connection to the teleconference has failed. Is that, tr is that true? I think we'll just go ahead, Jack. I think they tried to connect in a different way. Can you hear me all? If people can still hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So, um, Carolina there, the um, principle there of uh, trying to achieve uh, learner-centeredness. And the last uh, principle here has to do with reflection, the ability to, to look back, to review, and to think critically on one's teaching and to ask uh, reflective questions about it, critical questions, questions of this kind um, which you see there. So 
so the uh, capacity to um, review one's own practice, to, to seek to expand one's own knowledge and to try to find um, new ideas and practices that can be applied in one's own classroom. These are some of the examples of how uh, some of the teachers I spoke to talked about how they engage in critical reflection on their own practice. Uh, one teacher talks about keeping a teacher teaching journal and um, as a useful consciousness raising tool, one way of engaging in critical reflection. So those then are the first set of principles that, um, if you like, reflect some of the cognitive, uh, special cognitive skills, if you like, of creative teachers. Um, knowledgeable, confident, commitment to helping one's learners succeed, non-conformists, having available a wide range of strategies, risk-taking, learner-centered uh, lessons, and the notion of reflectivity. <laughs> now I want to go in uh, now to look in, uh, at how these uh, come across in terms of classroom practice. So picking up in, in a little more detail than those eight principles in terms of what they uh, result in in terms of classroom practice. One uh, is the notion of eclecticism, in other words, not being stuck with a particular method or approach, but uh, drawing on what we sometimes call principled eclecticism. In other words, um, using uh, a wide variety of teaching techniques and strategies instead of depending on a single method. And this teacher here uh, talks about his uh, eclectic approach to teaching and the idea of blending from different um, uh, teaching philosophies and practices, a best practice which utilizes anything that works with one's own learners. So not bound to a particular method. <clears throat> and so he goes on to talk about some of the methods that um, he's uh, been exposed to in his teacher training as a language teacher and how he, he finds something useful in all of them. He picks things out that are that are useful. So, eclectic approach there. Sometimes using principles of text-based teaching, sometimes more traditional approaches, and, and so on. Now, one of the issues that is interesting for me as a textbook writer is uh, what are the features of a task that give it uh, a creative dimension, and uh, what I try to do in writing materials is to often you're stuck with fairly familiar and traditional content, but you have to somehow uh, treat that content in an interesting way. And um, some of the features of activities which can uh, make them more creative are some of these that I've listed here, the extent to which this um, challenge topic, of course, personal element, not all of these, of course, are you able to address in any particular task, but one looks at the task and um, tries to see how one can twist it in a way or tweak it in a way to make it a little more creative, a little more engaging, and therefore more likely to provide a stimulus for students to interact and, and themselves use language creatively, um, intrigue, is there a level of individual choice? Uh, does the task involve uh, some form of risk taking? Take activities that require an original response from learners, so um, rather than simply repeating uh, content from the text, uh, tasks that encourage a personal and individual response, perhaps sometimes fantasy element, and so on. So um, looking for activities that have creative dimensions. Now, um, a group of uh, teachers I worked with recently, um, I gave them a text to look at. It was a short story uh, about a, a problem encountered by a handicapped child uh, first time he leaves home and travels by bus. And then during, during the, the journey, he's tricked into carrying a package by someone on the bus, and the boy 
becomes confused and goes to the police station where it's uh, discovered that the package actually contains drugs. And the, the police officer who, officer who interviews this child who's uh, is, uh, handicapped in some way um, doesn't believe the boy's story. They believe the boy's faking his illness. And the story ends up with a policeman discussing um, you know, what kind of prison that this boy will end up in. So there's a, a number of uh, issues that are raised in this, in this uh, text that the students, uh, teachers had to look at. So the question was, um, <clears throat> how would the teachers respond to this text? Some of them just saw it as language and they just treated it as a, an opportunity to practice reading skills and vocabulary and grammar and so on. Others, however, had a much more creative response to the text. They saw it as being having potential for raising students' awareness of handicapped conditions, promoting autonomy in learning, uh, and, and so on. So they were able to use the text in a much more creative way. So looking for creative ways of um, using activities then. And um, here is a comment from one of the teachers here on why she saw this text as having a great deal of potential rather than being a difficult text because of its uh, vocabulary and uh, narrative uh, structure, the conversational structure, written down uh, conversation. So using um, activities in a creative way. Another issue that um, teachers talked about was flexibility, if you like, uh, meaning the ability to switch between different styles and modes of teaching during a lesson. For example, if necessary, changing the, the pace of a lesson, giving more space and time to learners, or not necessarily using a lesson plan, but um, monitoring the learners' responses to the activity and creating learning activities around important teaching moments. And this notion of teaching moments was actually used by one of the teachers. And I like what he said here, um, or what she said here, important to choose teachable moments. These are sort of um, interactive decisions or critical incidents, if you like, that occur yeah, during the lesson. But the other teacher does say, however, these uh, teachable moments shouldn't take over the, um, the whole lesson. Do not allow students to move off your plan for the day. So uh, flexible there. Uh, other teachers here, again, I think reflecting this notion of flexibility and uh, willingness to improvise and uh, improvise around incidents that occur during a lesson, cap uh, capitalizing on uh, learning opportunities that they hadn't necessarily planned into the lesson. Different ways here in which teachers talked about um, adapting and departing from their lesson plans there. Of course, learning to teach means mastering the formats of different kinds of lessons, reading lessons and writing lessons, listening lessons, and so on. And lessons are structured in different ways depending on their content, but typically have fairly predictable sequences of openings um, tasks and closing. Of course, over time, um, teachers develop routines and procedures that enable these dimensions of lessons to be carried out efficiently and uh, effortlessly, if you like. But there is a tendency for teaching to become increasingly standardized with the one-size-fits-all approach, particularly when teachers are working within a prescribed curriculum and teaching towards tests. So this often results in a teacher working from prepackaged material such as a textbook and transmitting it, if you like, efficiently. I suppose this is appropriate at the beginning stages of a teacher's career, but shouldn't characterize the lessons of experienced teachers. So how do teachers find uh, new ways of doing, uh, doing things? And the, these might involve uh, making decisions of the, the kind we see there. Uh, as a way of uh, getting into a lesson. And um, here, for example, is a dialogue from a textbook, a fairly standard 
uh, way of uh, introducing new language here, the language of invitations. And so the dialogue um, models the opening and the um, invitation and so on. And so the standard way of presenting that would be in the teacher's book of you know, playing the tape and modeling the dialogue and having the students um, repeat it and then perhaps do some sort of follow-up activity. Um, I gave that to a bunch of teachers recently and I asked them to think of different ways of doing it. Some of them said, well, you could rewrite it about a different event. So instead of this being about, what is the event here, a soccer match, they could rewrite it about a different event. Um, you could extend the dialogue so it could continue. Um, some new topic could be introduced, you know, by the way, uh, you could have students uh, continue the conversation. You might, as this teacher said, add what we call echo responses. And so, um, what time does it start at 8 o'clock? An echo response would say, oh, 8 o'clock, where they would go in and echo something that the, uh, the speaker said, which is something we do in, in a conversation a lot. Um, or you could have them change some of the details. So these are simply examples of uh, teachers not sticking to the book. They're taking something fairly traditional from the book and uh, doing something a little bit more creative with it, creative ways of doing familiar things. Or uh, rewriting it in different ways of inviting. So. Um, Different, many different ways in which the teachers uh, describe what they could do with something as basic uh, and, and as mundane, if you like, as a simple dialogue, adding things to it um, and so on. Creative ways of doing uh, familiar things. Um, customizing their lessons, so adding things to provide additional practice, localizing the content, if you like, so while in many cases the book may work perfectly well without the need for much adaptation, in some cases different levels of adaptation might be needed, localizing the content. Um, this teacher is from Cambodia and talks about customizing his lessons. Um, mentions the fact that a lot of the content in um, international textbooks would be unfamiliar to students in Cambodia. And so because of the limited background knowledge of the students. So he um, changes the names of the people in the book, and basically helping, helping them connect the learning of English with their own knowledge of interest, just localizing content there as one example of how he is customizing his lessons to the student's need. Maybe um, reorganizing content um, um, and modifying the tasks and so on. So there would be many ways in which the teachers might um, change the content of the book and should be encouraged to do so. Technology, um, of course, nowadays there's huge opportunities to use technology to enhance learning experiences. Um, and this, uh, again, is a teacher from Singapore describing how she used uh, technology to um, in a creative way, I think, yeah. So they were asked to produce a two-minute public service announcement advertisement uh, to be included in a presentation on a social issue. And so she talks about how she took them through, trained them how to use some of the resources on their mobile phones um, and did a little model version of it there and show them how to use the various functions available to um, add uh, features to them, sounds and so on. And how she managed to uh, really develop an, an interesting and engaging lesson using technology there um, in a very creative way. And uh, again, talks about how quickly they picked it up. They were in their element. They were digital natives, if you like, and, uh, and so on. So technology then seems to be uh, increasingly uh, a resource that one can use to, to go beyond the book to take the students out of the classroom into the real world. And this is where one can really be extremely creative. Creative ways of um, motivating students as well, because in language learning is such a lengthy process 
many students um, lose their interest in language learning over time because they don't seem to be achieving their goals. They don't perhaps realize how much time is, is going to be involved in, um, in learning a new language. So how does one maintain motivation in that, uh, in that process? And this was a topic that a number of teachers referred to. This teacher, Patrick, talks about a teacher that particularly motivated him. We can perhaps, we perhaps all have um, uh, memories of teachers that uh, motivated us in that, in that kind of way. And so creative teachers seem to express a desire to motivate students, to challenge them, to engage their curiosity, to encourage, if you like, deep learning rather than surface learning. And um, perhaps by creating lessons that vary by using authentic materials, bringing in materials from outside of the, the real world, using activities that require students to think uh, creatively and perhaps by uh, encouraging creative collaboration among students. So to summarize then some of the ways in which the creative dispositions of these teachers were reflected in their reported classroom practices then um, and the six examples there they use activities that have creative dimensions, teaching in a flexible way, looking for new ways of doing things customizing the lessons and making use of technology as well as creative ways of motivating students. So if we accept the, um, the premise that creativity is a desirable feature of teaching um, and the teachers differ in the extent to which they teach creatively and if we want to foster a more creative um, approach to teaching in the schools, this brings me to the the um, third point of how creative uh, and creativity can be supported in the school. One way of thinking about it is to take a laissez-faire approach and assume that it's over to the individual teacher and that schools are more concerned about how well students perform on, uh, on standardized tests and so on um, or on the quality uh, or, or, or the school might be more focused on you know, what sort of technology they've managed to acquire, but um, commitment to creative teaching does require a change in um, my, a mindset. And here's an example of how um, a school discouraged creativity. This teacher said that he was given a course book to teach, and when he said, um, oh, well, I'll see how I can use it and how I can adapt it, he was told in no uncertain terms he was not to do this. He said the the students would be measured by their progress in terms of how far they've gotten through the book and so on. So he's basically told stick to the book and um, and not to uh, to do anything particularly creative with it. So that's a good example of how creativity can be discouraged in a school. Or when the curriculum, the tests and constant monitoring drives teaching and teachers cannot depart from practice or when they're not given time to be creative. Um, when they're not encouraged to do so and when they're stuck with fixed routines and procedures. So how does one move beyond this? Well, first of all, it's important for schools to help teachers recognize and share what is creative in their own practice, in the practice of their own teachers, because in any school you find teachers with different, different levels of skill and expertise and different levels of creativity. Um, how can a school help teachers recognize and share what is creative in the practice of their best teachers. Well, one school I visited recently, as I said, pe teachers post notes about different techniques they've used on a notice board. In another school, teachers have their own website where they exchange creative ideas and so on. Um, creative partnerships, teachers working together, team teaching, observing each other, and uh, sharing uh, lesson planning, for example. Creative partnerships between teachers, among teachers, can also help develop uh, uh, teacher's level of creative thinking and practice. Of course, um, what uh, kind of resources do the school make available to support creative teachers? So um, there should be opportunities for teachers to read, to think, to talk, to attend seminars and so on, the sort of support that teachers provide. And also, of course, um, rewarding creative teaching when it occurs by acknowledging 
uh, where it occurs uh, as appropriate by giving teachers opportunities to work with less experienced teachers, also encouraging um, teachers to share their ideas with others through round bags and, and uh, other types of activities. So um, uh, those are four um, ways in which a school can foster and support creative teaching, helping teachers recognize and share what's creative in their own practice, encouraging creative partnerships, and providing resources to support creative teaching, and lastly, um, rewarding creative teaching when it takes place. So just to summarize, as I say, I'm just about got through my my, my content in the 45 minutes that I would have loved to. I, I, of course, just focused on one aspect of teaching here, and there are many other important dimensions to effective teaching, but adding the concept of creative teaching to our understanding of what it means to be an effective teacher has benefits for teachers, for learners, as well as for schools. For learners, creative teaching helps them develop their capacities for original ideas and creative thinking. Also, of course, improves the quality of the experiences they receive and helps develop increased levels of motivation and even self-esteem, I think. For the teacher, of course, it provides a source of ongoing professional renewal and satisfaction since when learners are engaged, motivated, and successful, teaching is motivated, um, motivating for the teacher. For the institution, it can lead to increased levels of satisfaction for both teachers and students, as well as contribute to quality, effectiveness, and of course the reputation of the school. So then, to summarize, creative learners need creative teachers, and teachers need to work in schools where creativity is valued and shared. And so on that note, I'll thank you. And um, the um, content of this talk, by the way, is on my website if you want to um, read a little bit more about it. Uh, and I think we now have an opportunity to um, respond to some of the issues that you've perhaps raised during, the, during this um, rather um, hasty presentation. So I think now it's an um, opportunity for me to see what you've um, had to say and think and look forward to some of your feedback. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Dr. Richards, for your insightful and engaging presentation. We're now going to invite you to respond to the questions that have um, been generated across the presentation. So please continue to type in your questions in this Q&A session that will be facilitated by Dr. Odo. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, uh, David. And thanks very much for the informative presentation, uh, Dr. Richards. So I've gone ahead and uh, collected several questions across your talk, and I'll uh, just go ahead and ask you them, and you can right. share your thoughts. OK. Here's the easy ones for okay. me, will you? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the first one that came up was uh, kind of a, a combination of uh, two questions. Yeah. And it's basically asking about um, newer teachers. So uh, Victor Huger, uh, apologize if I'm mispronouncing, um, asked, is it possible to adapt, create, contextualize without knowing the theoretical base? Um, if, yeah, if that makes sense. So if teachers don't have kind of a theoretical background or a theoretical basis, are they able to be as uh, creative as we would, would like? Right. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, early on in the talk that, the, that I think to be creative in a positive way, in a purposeful way, you need to have a solid um, background. At least you know you have to know something about your subject matter. You have to know uh, something about what it is you're trying to achieve and how you're trying to get there. Um, and let me get, just give you an example of a teacher being creative but purposeless. And this was a teacher that I worked with um, a few years ago. And, and no, matter, no matter what class this teacher taught, whether it be a writing class or whatever it was, he always started with about 10 or 15 minutes of an activity he called sponting, in which he would just put words on the board and um, do a sort of word association. He might, might put up the word English, and then he'd ask them how many words they can think of that end, of, end with ish. And then um, this would go on and on, this sort of free association, which he thought you know, was a good warm-up activity. And um, when I asked him what was the theoretical basis for, what did it, how did it link to what he was trying to teach, and so on, he didn't really have a convincing reply. 
to my mind, it was an example of purposeless creativity. So yes, it's very easy in a sense to be uh, creative, but that creativity has to be um, has to have a purpose to it. So um, and and uh, the the relevance here of a relevant knowledge base is that it helps you identify um, an appropriate purpose for. I mean, if you don't know anything about the nature of reading, the nature of literacy. Um, it's likely that you might be creative in ways that might be you know, counterintuitive or might in fact discourage um, the development of effective reading strategies. So coming back to I think Victor's question there, um, yes, you, you have, have to, the two have to go hand in hand, knowledge and then the ability to draw on that knowledge in creating um, a creative response to an issue if you like. I hope that sort of answers the question. Of course, there is some theory and knowledge that is going to be more relevant than others, and that's an issue for people like ourselves who are designing teacher education courses, is to make sure that the, the, the content knowledge, the pedagogical knowledge, and the, the disciplinary knowledge that we provide is actually helping teachers with the kind of thinking and acting that, actions that they have to take. That's a, uh, another issue, too. Thanks for that question, mm. Carol. Great. Um, so the next question is, this is actually an amalgam of uh, two questions. So the first part is from Rebecca Beria. And both of these questions get at teacher self-perceptions. So she, this is more of a comment from her, but the follow-up question was actually asked by uh, Dr. Albers. So she says, people don't often perceive themselves as being creative or thinking creat uh, creatively. And they, they tend to think that it's something, you know, only artist, quote unquote, uh, artist types have. And Dr. Elbers asks, well, then how do we convince teachers that they are, in fact, creative? That's an interesting question. Um, because you, you have to start with um, awareness of how you're teaching, so self-awareness. And, and uh, so you can't really evaluate your own teaching or re reflect on your own teaching un until you have a good picture of how it is you're going about it. And this may, be, may, may come about through looking at a video of your lesson. It may um, come across through looking at the way you responded to a lesson planning activity and so on. So, but I think when teachers work in groups and compare the way they might address a particular issue and the different strategies that, that, uh, they, that might be appropriate, they can then step back and ask, you know, to which extent are we uh, are we going further with the task? Are we adding a creative dimension to it? Are we simply using a sort of tried and tested technique that uh, we've got from one of our professors or from one of our books? Or are we looking for ways of going beyond that um, uh, in order to, to make the activity more engaging? So it is true that um, sometimes the best and the most creative teachers in the school uh, may be unknown to other teachers. And that's why it's always useful, I think, to make use of opportunities for peer observation where you simply look at how teachers deal with the same sort of lesson content that you might have had to prepare, not to evaluate in any sense, but to, to see in what ways does the teacher um, make that lesson more creative. So of course you have to have a sort of checklist or some sort of criteria for saying what is a creative way of um, addressing the issue and what is not. So to those two things there I think are uh, are important. Having um, some criteria for deciding uh, when a lesson has a creative dimension and the sort of principles that I articulated there, I, I hope would um, go some way to help um, answering that uh, question. Uh, um, and then um, looking reflectively and um, comparing different teachers' um, uh, responses to a particular pedagogical issue or a particular issue that came up at during a lesson. Great, thanks. Um, so my next question comes from uh, Christy Pace, and she asks, she says, I agree with these principles, in the for but she's talking about in the forefront of education here in the US is the common core standards. Um, right. And so how do we, sorry? Yes, yeah, yeah, please continue, yeah. OK, so um, she asks, how do we enjoin our creativity in a system that imposes these kinds of constraints? So I guess basically it's, you know, you, you touched on this a bit in your presentation, but how do we address, how do we generate creativity when there's, you know, a standardized curriculum and kind of high stakes tests that teachers are dealing with? 
That's right. Well, this is this is a worldwide problem because standards and um, other ways of um, monitoring learning outcomes are sort of everywhere these days, and they are a constraint. Uh, and yet, I think one has to uh, to draw on the experience of of creative teachers to find out how they how they do achieve the kind of teaching that they do, despite the fact that they are working within a, an exam or a, a, a test driven. Um, system. So um, many teachers do. Um, I mean, all, all teachers have to teach to tests to some extent, um, and are often evaluated according to how well the students do on tests. But despite that, um, teachers, creative teachers, have uh, find ways. I think of working around that. Of you know, it's not one or the other. It's not one or the other. You can still uh, work towards those standards and yet find opportunities for making teaching more engaging through um, creative uh, approaches to teaching. So I think um, the, the mere fact that one is working to course standards doesn't mean that one is simply going to um, teach to the test, if you like. Uh, that's, a, that's a challenge for every, every teacher, no matter what subject he or she is teaching. And yet we find outstanding teachers who and, and uh, you know, everyday teachers who seem to be able to teach very creatively despite the fact that they are operating within these constraints. So I don't think we need to abandon um, all the, uh, you know, exciting uh, pedagogical theories and strategies that uh, are available to us simply because um, at the end of the day the students have to uh, attain certain standards because creative teaching might be a better way of helping students um, attain those standards because it does help uh, it raise the engagement level. It does help um, increase the amount of attention that students uh, perhaps give to task, and also the more opportunities for uh, communication and, um, and collaboration. So I, I think uh, it's not an either-or uh, choice, to my mind. Oh, great. Thanks. That's good points. Um, so I guess this is kind of a, something of a follow-up question. Uh, HK5 asks, should we develop and assess teacher crea uh, creativity in teacher education? And in, if so, in what ways would we do that? Um, I'm not sure. That's a tricky one. Whether one, um, we, we want to encourage uh, teachers to, to be creative and reward them in a sense for doing so. Um, but teachers, you know, two teachers might be creative in a very different way. Because there are many ways in which a, a, a lesson can be effective, even if teachers choose different strategies for getting there. So I think it's um, it, it's the outcomes of the lesson. The creativity might only be one strand to it. It's the it's the level of engagement that the teachers achieve during the lesson, um, the extent to which the content was mastered, and so on. So um, tricky one, isn't it? Whether we um, can evaluate teachers according to levels of creativity. I don't think we we can really. I think we encourage it and ask teachers to, uh, to describe how they achieve it. It's one of the one of the um, things that we could include in our criteria for what teachers should be working towards in a lesson. Um, but sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. So I'm not sure that I've answered that one very effectively myself. <laughs> Perhaps somebody else has a, a, a good answer to that question as well. What do you folks there think? Yeah, that, I mean it's a good question. I uh, I'm I'm not sure I'd have a, a great answer to it myself. Um, and so yeah, maybe in the comments some folks might want to uh, share their thoughts on that. Um, so I have another question here. This one's actually from Dr. Elbers again, um, and I just thought it might be interesting to you, given your own interest in the arts. She this is more of a comment, but I wonder if you'd be willing to comment on her comment. She says, I wonder how drawing and the visual arts come into play with creativity and teaching. Uh, many teachers are less likely to include visual art because they see this as a very creative activity. So do you have any thoughts on that, Dr. Richards? I don't particularly, but um, you know, just uh, earlier this year, I spent um, a few months at, uh, in Hong Kong uh, in an English department that I set up there some years ago. And, and recently, the department has added to its uh, curriculum a focus on creative writing and uh, literature as well. And um, I have never had much opportunity to work with specialists in creative writing, fiction writers and so on in particular. 
and um, just sitting in on some of the workshops and, and um, the sessions that those um, scholars uh, presented did, um, I found, generate lots of ideas that I thought I could apply in different ways to my own teaching. So this is an example of um, moving outside a traditional ESL kind of curriculum to a sort of more literature-based curriculum, and particularly um, looking at uh, creative fiction and different forms of creative writing and what one could learn, with, learn from that. So that's not exactly um, taking you into the arts, but um, certainly looking at creativity in different fields and experiencing and, uh, creative, creativity in different fields could be a, a good way of um, stimulating thought about what does it mean to be creative. And so there may be some transfer back to one's own teaching, even though the activities that one did um, were not ones that would immediately apply to one's own teaching. So I think any experience with creativity um, is likely to be uh, a useful learning opportunity, whether it be from art, from, from you know, poetry writing and, or, or fiction writing and so on. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, I think we're kind of uh, running short on time, so I'll just say thank you very much for the thoughtful and insightful answers, and thanks again to all of our participants um, for the insightful questions. So I'll go ahead and uh, I'll turn you over to David. So thanks again, Dr. Richards. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Richards. You certainly offer an intriguing and forward-thinking perspective on tonight's literacy conversation and much to consider in the realm of literacy education. Thank you for this. Let's give them another virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We would appreciate you taking a moment to type into the chat area one thought about this web seminar. We'd also would like to take you to take 10 minutes to fill out the GCR survey. The link is located on the GCLR website. Your participation enables us to understand online spaces for critical talk and discussions about literacy issues. Additionally, if you're willing to participate in a 15 to 20 minute interview as part of the GCLR research study, please type your name and email into the chat area and someone from the research team will con contact you within a week to schedule an interview. Please schedule future web seminars on your calendar. We have outstanding literacy scholars who will present on a wide range of research. As you know, these are open access web seminars. So please share our project with others whom you think would be interested. Please join us on November 3rd for Dr. Joyce Keene and again in January for Drs. Ken and Yetta Goodman. Access to archives of past GCLR web seminars are now available at Global Conversations in Literacy wordpress.com. On behalf of the GCLR research team and me, David Brown, thank you for all sharing this hour with Dr. Richards and us. GCLR truly appreciates your attendance, participation, and most importantly, your interest in these most important decisions about literacy. For those of you wishing to continue the conversation generated by Dr. Richards' talk, please join the Twitter room hashtag GCLR underscore GSU following this presentation. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening or morning.